it to the cloud. So welcome to the UNCG Libraries webinar series on research and applications, where we talk about um, things to do with research. So we've been doing this now, I think for about four years. Um, and uh, today, Jenny Dale, our information literacy coordinator, will be talking about step-by-step -step scaffolding information literacy skill development into any course. Um, so it's a kind of small group right now, but I'll update people in the chat if they come in. So um, you will receive a recording of this, whether you are here live or signed up to come, but couldn't come live. And uh, they're all placed on that link that I put you in the chat that I put in the chat. And then um, also um, I'll send an email out with the recording after this, once it's processed and put on YouTube where we also close caption it. Um, I'm happy to turn um, live transcripts on as well. And I'll remind people in the chat. I'll just go ahead and do that because that doesn't hurt anything. And you can hide it, Jenny, if you want. Oh, you're the main host. Never mind. Oh, let me turn it on. Doesn't matter. Um, it takes, it so, takes yeah, me a second. It, yeah, and so with the live transcripts, you can choose to turn them off um, and it won't hurt people who want to use them. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, so the next one, I have to leave a little bit early. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you all about the next one coming up in this series. It's on September 14th at 1130 a.m. And it's called Help, Predatory Journal, What Do I Do? by Anna Kraft, who does a lot of our scholarly communication stuff for UNCG libraries. And this will be about um, avoiding entanglement with uh, predatory and exploitive journals. Uh, so check that out if you want. And um, the link to sign up for all of the webinars are on that. And if you tab through, you can see other webinars coming up in other series, including online learning, as well as a Mac webinar series, which is brand new um, for this year. Uh, about the Mac implementation process. So um, keep all of those in mind. And I'll try, I manage the chat as you all know. Uh, so if you have any questions, let me know in the chat. Um, if I have, because I have to leave a little bit early, Jenny can grab the chats at the end, um, but y'all can stay and unmute for that. Um, y'all already have your cameras off, uh, but keep in mind that if you keep turn your camera on, you will be in the recording some, um, which does go on YouTube. Uh, so you're welcome to unmute and ask questions uh, with your camera off or on. It's up to you. So without further ado, here's Jenny to talk about step-by-step -step scaffolding information literacy skill development into any course. Thanks, Jenny. All right. Thank you, Sam. Yes, welcome. Uh, I am Jenny Dale. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the information literacy coordinator at UNCG Libraries. Um, I didn't list it on here, but I have also been involved in the um, Mac Minerva's Academic Curriculum Program in a variety of ways, um, including in uh, this past semester as a Mac Fellow. Um, so I am going to talk a little bit about Mac today because uh, information literacy is part of Mac. And I think the folks who are in here know that pretty well. Um, but if you're watching this recording, you may not know that information literacy is one of the critical competencies that we wanted students to uh, achieve before, or to become confident in before leaving UNCG. Um, and Sam has kindly posted the slides link into uh, the Zoom chat, um, but here it is up on the screen as well, go.uncg.edu slash ILSCAF. That is not a slide I meant to include. So super glad that that is in here. Okay, let's tackle some definitions. Oops. Um, information literacy, I'm gonna start with that. So information literacy is something I end up defining a lot, right? Cause it's in my job title. And also as we are sort of again, integrating it into Mac a little bit more intentionally than we have in gen ed programs past. Uh, and I typically use this definition, which is from the Association of College and Research Libraries. Um, and that definition is, information literacy is a set of integrated abilities encompassing the reflective discovery of information, understanding of how information is produced and valued, and the use of information, including new knowledge and participating ethically in communities of learning. So if we break that down a little bit further, the way that I usually would think of this is, it's about knowing what kind of information you need, knowing where and how to find it, understanding how to sort of evaluate and understand the information that you find, and then how to use it in an ethical way that shows that you value the intellectual property of others. So information literacy shows up in two main places in Minerva's academic curriculum. It shows up in the foundations course, and I have pulled out the 
uh, and I'm sorry for all the sort of jargon um, acronyms on this page, but I'm just trying to make everything fit. Um, in the foundations, the information literacy related student learning outcomes are four and five. Four is critically evaluate information in media sources in a variety of formats. And five is incorporate and cite sources accurately and correctly. And you'll notice that in the MAC health and wellness SLOs that are related to information literacy, uh, we have an overlap. We have integrate, I think I have, maybe I copied this wrong, integrate and cite sources accurately and correctly. These are essentially the same kind of concept. Um, so in this way, we already have a little bit of scaffolding built into the MAC program related to information literacy. But there is another one in uh, health and wellness, which is to synthesize information from multiple sources to support arguments and or inform decisions. And this is particularly important when we think about health and wellness, when we think about health literacy, when we think about consumer health information, knowing that you're probably going to have to consult a few sources, no matter what research you might be doing in that area, and really integrate and synthesize the information that those sources are providing. So this is just to kind of give us some context. Um, defining instructional scaffolding is actually a bit harder than I was anticipating when I went into this, because it's for me, it's one of those like, oh, yeah, I know it when I see it kind of things. Um, but a lot of um, folks who write and talk about this refer back to this article from, um, I believe it's the Journal of Educational Psychology, but I do have um, references at the end of my slides here. Wood and colleagues are often credited with being the first to use the sort of metaphor of scaffolding to describe the process by which novice learners, or in their case, they're talking about children, can be supported by expert learners, or uh, not learners, I guess, teachers, expert teachers, or again, in their case, adults. And it's all about developing the skills necessary to be able to complete tasks or to gain specific skills kind of over time. And I have a pretty lengthy quote from them that I will not read entirely for you. But when they talk about scaffolding, they're talking about these sort of expert uh, being the person who sort of controls all the elements of the task initially slowly sort of taking away the supports that are provided over time until the, in this case, child, but what we would be talking about are our students, until that learner is capable of completing the entire task on their own. Um, and we can think about scaffolding in sort of different ways. Um, one of the things that, that is often referenced when people talk about scaffolding as an instructional concept is Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. The idea that you kind of want to be in the sweet spot between like, oh, this thing is really easy for me to do, or this thing is impossibly hard for me to do. Kind of a reach goal type of thing, right? So for many of our students, that's what we need to kind of consider. What, what can we do to make sure that they're challenged enough in our information literacy assignments? and activities without making it just sort of beyond their capacity to complete. My favorite definition comes from Andrea Baer, who is a, a, an academic librarian that I know, um, who teaches a whole professional development course for librarians about scaffolding information literacy. This is from an article that she wrote about scaffolding and flexible instruction that again, I have in my uh, references list, but here's what she says. Scaffolding, perhaps one of the most widely discussed approaches to structuring learning experiences, involves opportunities for incremental learning experiences that build on students' prior knowledge and skills. So I find this to be sort of the, the definition that resonates with me the most because we're talking about that incremental learning, we're talking about creating opportunities, and then we're also talking about activating prior knowledge and skills. And one of the things that's important to remember is uh, you know, our students come to us with lots and lots of prior knowledge and prior skills. And one of the things that we can do is activate those early on and then through scaffolding, continue to activate them throughout the semester as that knowledge and skills uh, starts to build. So scaffolding for information literacy uh, can happen in a lot of different ways. Um, one way that we see it talked about a lot in the library and information science literature is scaffolding over the course of a major or curricular program. So kind of like what I mentioned with Mac, we see a little bit of scaffolding from foundations up to health and wellness. Um, but often people are talking about this in, in 
terms of curriculum mapping a specific program, which so which academic programs um, you're in and which courses in those you might decide, OK, in this class, we really want to focus on building uh, information literacy skills around searching. Here's one where we want to really talk a lot about evaluating. This is the capstone course where we want to be able to bring it all back together. Um, and I have a couple of articles referenced here, and I will say I didn't do this on purpose, but one of these articles does actually feature among the et al listed uh, Amy harris Houck, who was here with us today. Um, so there have been a number of articles about curriculum mapping related to information literacy, um, but I pulled out two that I think are particularly useful in sort of looking at what that can look like. It can also be in a single course, but over, you know, over an entire semester, or some folks even talk about it for librarians to draw on scaffolding concepts within their own sort of single one shot library instruction sessions. We're going to be focusing on a single course today. Um, and as I am looking at the folks who are here, I know at least one of you is teaching a Mac course so that will have some scaffolding in it. Um, so we're going to work through an example real quick here. And I will be asking you to use the chat a little bit. So I like to give folks a, a bit of warning um, before I request that. So does this sound familiar? This is not a real research paper assignment. It's one I made up based on my many years of looking at research paper assignments. Um, write a thesis driven paper on a topic of your choice that connects with course content. Your paper should be six to eight pages and should include six credible sources, two of which should be peer reviewed. Use APA style. Again, kind of paraphrasing, but these are pretty common sort of expectations that I see listed on assignment sheets. So what I want to ask you to do and see if you will engage with me in the chat is what are the information literacy skills that are actually necessary to complete this assignment? So I'm going to give you a moment, let you type some stuff in the chat for me. I will read out what comes up in the chat for the purpose of the recording. Um, but yeah, what, what skills are we talking about here? What skills are necessary to be able to effectively complete this research paper assignment? I've got a couple of things so far. So what is APA and what does it mean to cite something? How to determine if information is credible and peer reviewed. So those are two of the things that have come up so far. Integrating citations. Um, how do I start writing a paper? Yep, finding relevant information. Like this is a pretty big ask, especially if um, we haven't really talked about these skills throughout the semester. Um, so we would, of course, expect that a, a true assignment sheet would be more detailed than this, but it would probably still ask a lot of the same things of our students. So here are some of the information literacy skills I identified, which overlap with quite a bit what y'all talked about. And I'm focusing on this information literacy piece, but there's all this other stuff that's tied in too. How do I start writing a paper? Uh, what is an appropriate topic for this subject area that I'm studying? How do I, you know, sort of communicate as uh, a member of this discipline? But just for the information literacy skills, um, to, to do this basic sort of research assignment that we see all the time, you would, a student would need to be able to identify a topic to determine what information is needed to help them actually, you know, sort of make an argument or or craft a thesis around that topic, develop a search strategy, including not only search terms, but knowing where to search, where to get started. They're gonna to have to evaluate sources for credibility. And even more specifically, they're gonna to have to look at sources and determine whether or not they're peer reviewed. They're gonna to have to integrate sources into the argument and they're gonna use quoting, paraphrasing, other uh, you know, other types of integration like summarizing, and they also have to be able to cite sources correctly based on, in this case, specifically APA style. That's a lot of stuff when we think about it. Um, and one of the most common models that I do see is that there's not a lot of research necessarily built in through the semester, and this is kind of the final big summative assessment um, for the course. So I have 
uh, I said this here, I've just repeated myself. It's a lot of skills to complete. It's a lot that you need to be able to just complete this one assignment. So here's an example of one way that you could potentially integrate some scaffolding. And this is sort of a six step process that I am suggesting that I have seen um, or that I have actually used in courses. One is to go ahead and start by having students turn in their proposed topic. So that's a really important part of the information literacy process because being able to understand and determine the appropriate scope helps you figure out what kind of information is needed. And that is a really important piece of the puzzle because of course, if you get all the way to the end and they've completed a paper about a topic that wasn't really appropriate, they're not gonna be successful in the assignment. So that's turn in their proposed topic, get a little bit of feedback. This is pretty common. I see this happen in a lot of courses that I work with. Students might complete an assignment focused on search strategies or search behaviors. Um, this is again a place, basically with each one of these six steps, um, what I'm suggesting is that uh, there are supports at each, of these, at each of these sections. So the support for the first one is you get some feedback from your professor about your topic. Um, the second one might be the kind of thing where maybe you get some feedback from a librarian or maybe it's more automated. Maybe it's a, a sort of Canvas module that students complete and they get some feedback um, based on how they answer certain questions. One of the things I recommend, especially for sort of lower level courses, is that if you're gonna ask students to use peer reviewed articles, uh, ease them into that. Um, peer reviewed articles we know are challenging to read because uh, they you know, conform to a lot of disciplinary conventions that we only you know, understand over time. They tend to have a lot of jargon. Uh, they can be hard to just sort of tease apart. So having students complete an assignment maybe where they find a peer-reviewed article and they summarize it for you, or everybody looks at the same peer-reviewed article that's maybe just part of what, you know, you want them to read for your course, and they each do a, a sort of analytical assignment. Annotated bibliographies are really popular, and I would consider these to be good scaffolding tools uh, in terms of an assignment because an annotated bibliography gives you the opportunity not only to give students feedback on their citation skills um, in a slightly lower stakes kind of way, but also gives you the opportunity to say, you know, these, these are gonna be challenging sources for you to integrate into that final paper. These don't have a lot to do with each other. And that also can help you um, deal with uh, students who are, leaning more towards that sort of cherry picking or berry picking, depending on what articles you look at, just looking for some quotes they can throw into their source. We've all done it, we've all done it. Um, but this again, gives you a time to do some course correcting to say, actually this article, even if it has a really great quote that you know it can go with your argument, it's not really all that relevant. Um, then students might complete a draft of the final paper and then they're getting some feedback uh, you know, about from you about how it all came together. Um, and then of course the final paper. And so there have been a lot of supports built in throughout this. And this would be something I would propose spreading out over the whole semester really. And this is kind of a linear model, right? It doesn't really, doesn't really mimic what, what real research looks like, but it's a model that we can use to say, okay, when you're completing a research assignment, you might start here and then move here and kind of move through in, in a logical way um, so that students are, again, kind of building their skills. So if they've built some skills to understand peer-reviewed articles in number three, it's going to be a lot easier for them to complete an annotated bibliography in which they have to uh, annotate some peer-reviewed articles, for example. Another option is less sort of linear and it's more um, about integration again sort of throughout the semester. So one of the things that I highly recommend is asking students to, if you're gonna have a final paper or a final assignment, or if you're in one of these MAC courses where students are gonna have to you know, be able to show that they can cite, really the more opportunities, the better. So one of the things that I recommend is if you have minor assignments like journal entries, reflections, um, you know, just sort of quick things that students might do that they would usually not really need to find sources for, 
you can ask them to find and cite credible sources. Uh, and what this does over time, based on your feedback, first off, it's pretty low stakes for them. So if they mess up a citation or if the source they use isn't great, um, it's not you know ruining their grade, right? But you are able to say to them, okay, this is an interesting source that you found, um, but you might need to uh, look at APA style a little bit more, whatever style it is for your course. Um, or this uh, isn't a really credible source, but your citation looks good, right? So over the course of the semester, they're, they're having these smaller um, but really critical opportunities to practice these skills as they're develop, de developing them, but to do them, to practice them in a way that feels sort of safer um, and has, you know, again, lower stakes in terms of grades. Um, during a class session, I would, I would in, the, in, in one of these examples, I might have students complete some sort of guided activity, maybe in groups that helps them break down a peer reviewed article source. So again, I'm, I'm including this, let's talk about what peer reviewed articles in our field are really like, um, because that's not something that we can assume a student would have as prior knowledge. If they do, that's awesome. They're at an advantage and they can do some peer to peer learning. Um, but often, you know, this is going to be something that benefits our students. Um, and I have a particular activity that I do um, that is from a resource I'll show you later that's called a scholarly article autopsy that has uh, a sort of guided list of questions to help students look at a peer reviewed article, sort of break down what goes where and why. And then students might complete either a draft or an annotated bibliography or both and then they complete their final paper. But in both of these examples that I have mentioned, um, you know, this is throughout the semester. And to me, that's, that's what makes it a more scaffolded approach is that you are, are giving all of these sort of opportunities for incremental learning and incremental skill development. And that it's happening alongside and sort of in that way, uh, integrated with your course content, the actual academic content of your course that you're teaching. So students are learning to, um, you know, integrate what research looks like in public health, in political science, in, you know, communication studies, in whatever field it is, they're seeing what that looks like while they're also learning some of that course content as well. Look at my timing here. Um, I'm going to kind of skip this just because of timing, but one of the things that you just might want to think about as you're sort of brainstorming is, okay, how else could we do this? Because really the possibilities are basically endless in terms of scaffolding, as long as you are building in those really intentional supports throughout, uh, it can look all kinds of different ways. And when you're thinking about this, some of the things that I would recommend considering are working with your librarian, of course. This was, I mean, you probably all knew I was going to mention this. Um, librarians can do a lot to help you. Um, we can help you design research assignments effectively, uh, either, you know, from the beginning, like we sit together and actually come up with the assignment together, or you share an assignment that you have or an assignment idea, and we can talk to you a little bit about how we could see that being most effectively designed to work for students. The other reason I recommend this is that we can also tell you, oh, we don't have a lot of resources that are going to support an assignment like that. That's pretty rare, you know, unless you were like, I don't really want my students to write a scholarly paper about engineering, which we don't have a lot of engineering resources because we don't have an engineering program. But we can sort of come up with, uh, give you ideas if there are things that we see that are going to be challenging. An example earlier in my career um, at a different institution, there was this assignment floating around in the first year writing course where um, students were supposed to write a researched essay about freshman parking. <laughs> and I actually saw this a little bit when I got here, um, but uh, believe it or not, there's not a lot of research out there that you can use to talk about freshmen being able to park on a college campus. Um, so that was an assignment that where some intervention from a librarian would have been helpful. Uh, you can also work with a librarian to help you develop activities either that you use with your students or that they use with your students to sort of build information literacy skills. We have lots of expertise in this area. This is, this is what we do. 
Um, and then we can also, of course, teach one or more sessions, whether it's synchronously or asynchronously, that can help students continue to build these different skills. So having one, they're often referred to as one shots in our world, having one one shot with a librarian and then having a final paper due at the end, I wouldn't consider that scaffolding. It's still not enough sort of checkpoints or support points. Um, it's, it's getting there. It's an additional thing beyond just assigning the paper. Um, but, you know, in a one shot session or even two one shot sessions, we're not going to be able to actually help students get into the writing process and get that kind of help that they need. Uh, I recommend using backward design. This is uh, the approach that I pretty much always use for my own instructional design. I'm particularly a fan of, thanks Sam, um, of uh, Understanding by Design by Wiggins and McTie. Um, and their three-step model is first to identify your desired results. So really think, how do I want this to end? What do I want them to get out of this? Then determine what evidence or assessment is going to be acceptable and then develop your learning plans. It's really easy to say, oh, I'm really excited about teaching this. I'm gonna jump in and create a bunch of cool activities and stuff without necessarily thinking about how that um, is going to ultimately work towards what, what desired results you have. And then finally, I recommend consulting some resources that are out there. Um, and let me put the link to these slides in here again. Um, that is that is not the link. Hold on, that was a different thing entirely. Um, okay, so that is a a link to the slideshow. So these are active links that you can take a look at. Um, uh, there is a school, a toolkit from Poundly, which is a I think it's the Pennsylvania Academic Libraries Network, some kind of consortium for academic libraries in Pennsylvania. Um, but it's a great resource. They have a whole guide about scaffolding library instruction or scaffolding information literacy, and it has some great resources as well as sort of additional research you can look into. Um, Project Cora is one that I recommend pretty highly, um, and Project Cora is where I initially got that scholarly article autopsy that I mentioned, that sort of opportunity that we can have to really break down a scholarly article. And then we have something called the Research Assignment Toolkit, which is a little bit out of date, but I wanted to share it with you because I am working on it. Um, so I am actually planning to uh, add a tab here about information literacy scaffolding. Um, so you can keep an eye out for that. You can always contact me if you have questions or, or uh, want to talk through any of these things more, um, but I know we are right at, at noon, so I totally understand if people have to head out, but I will stay and answer any questions that you have, um, and also just to let you know that I have references here on my slide. If any of you were, I know at least two of you were at my um, session yesterday about anti-plagiarism education where I talked about the importance of citing your sources on your teaching materials, so just wanted to show y'all that I'm really doing it. Any questions at this point? <laughs> yes, Amy. Good job. You may see how AH listed as one of these authors. And there she is right here on our screen with us today. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Let me, I'm just going to pop my email address in here again. Now, you all will have your own sort of official librarian that you'll work with as a liaison. Um, but um, if, Joan, if you don't mind if I use this as an example while you're here, Sam recently talked to me about a class that Joan is teaching. Um, and sort of Sam came to me in my capacity as the information literacy coordinator um, to get some advice. So that's another option too. You can always kind of um, contact me or ask your librarian to bring me in. Um, because again, not only is that, of course, my area of expertise, it's my job title, but it is also something that I have worked on a lot um, as part of the transition to the SNAC um, gen ed curriculum. So I'm here to help to all of you who are here and any of you who are watching the recording. I'm here for you. Your other, your liaison librarians here for you. We're all here for you. We would love to help you with this. All right, I'm not seeing any questions, so I am going to uh, stop our recording now. <laughs>